<laughs> well, there has been quite a build up to this. You know, this is just a talk on, on imaging and then treatment's a little smaller, so I'll cover that. But since there was such a build up, <clears throat> I thought I should start with a joke. So my, my dad uh, went through uh, prostate cancer treatment years ago. He was 80 years old. And I was going to micromanage his entire treatment because I certainly didn't think he could do it himself, he or my mom. So I made him drive from the farm in Wisconsin over to Minneapolis because he was going to go to one of my clinics. He wasn't going to go anywhere else. So I said, you know, I'll meet you at the urologist's office. Well, what was I thinking? Here I am sitting with my mom and my dad in front of a urologist. And, you know, they're talking about all kinds of things that really I have no business sitting there and listening to. And one of them was um, treating with Lupron, which shrinks your prostate gland, but it also does cause you to be impotent. And my mother sprang right up and said, oh, my, Dick, my dad, what are we going to do about <laughs> What are we going to do about that? And my dad said, don't worry, dear. We have great neighbors. <laughs> so there were other things that happened in that consult that the doctor was falling on the floor and laughing. And I could tell you about those at some other time. But anyway, in all seriousness, um, we are dealing with real human beings here. And real patient lives. And everybody in this room is very concerned and does the best they can for the best quality of radiation treatment. This is a young woman, uh, breast cancer. She has two children, and we want to do the best that we can for her. Here's another patient talking to the nurse. And in radiation therapy, a lot of people don't realize this, and I'm, I'm sure you do. If I say anything you already know, just don't be insulted. But, uh, you know, we treat them for anywhere three weeks to six, seven weeks. We really get to know these people. And they become really part of your, your family, in a sense, and your confidant. Um, here's another patient, a prostate cancer patient, talking with a nurse, um, physici uh, physician talking with a patient about his treatment. And, you know, we see these people every day. I am in a small clinic. I see a lot of these people almost every day, and I really uh, get a kick out of um, talking to some of them and trying to make their day a better place. Um, so to keep you awake again, I just thought of another, this particular gentleman, we asked him, what are you going to do tonight when you go home? And he says, well, you know, I'm really kind of into that show, Orange is a New Black. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about that show, and I was like, oh my gosh. So anyway, the things you learn when you talk to patients. And again, um, here's a breast cancer patient and her daughter and the physician and, you know, on their last day of treatment. Uh, we wish them well, and e even though they don't want to come back, they're sad that they have to leave because um, they really get to know everybody. So breast cancer, I'll start with that. Um, and some of this will be uh, a compliment to Kathleen's first talk. And it's very important that we image the patient in the same position. So even though Kathleen still has a conventional simulator, uh, you don't see many of those anymore. Everything is a CT scanner and um, have to lay them down in the same position, same immobilization. You have to make sure the patients are comfortable and that they can hold that position. Putting the arm up sometimes is very difficult for uh, a patient to do, so we have to make sure they can do that. Sometimes both their arms have to go up, either for a breast treatment or lung treatments, the arms have to go up. So we really have to make sure that they're comfortable and they can hold that position. Um, here's a, a sponge under the knees. There is no pad that this patient is going to be able to lay on because we don't want the radiation to go through the pad. But there's all kinds of considerations that go into play when we're getting ready to um, simulate a patient. So breast cancer, you know what? Unfortunately, it's common, and we've kind of got it down how to treat it um, because we do it a lot. And so after the patient is imaged, that scan is sent right to the treatment planning system and we throw a couple beams on there, and this is pretty much your bread and butter treatment right here. So this is the radiation field. These are the beams coming in. We're trying to avoid critical structures. Um, this is what the anterior view would look like. And the real bonus now comes in, how do we know we're doing the right thing? So we used to take port films, but now we can do instantly, uh, so the patient doesn't have to lay there as long, the portal, portal imaging. I must be standing too close. Um, so here's your portal image, and here's your lung, 
Here's a patient's breast. We're comparing it then to a digitally reconstructed radiograph from the CT scan. And here's my patient field on here. Here's my lung volume here. Here's the lung volume in green here. And we want to make sure that we are in the same position and treating the same thing. And so this takes a matter of uh, one second. So we don't have to worry about patient movement. Uh, it used to be you have to take a film, run, run to your processor, wait a minute and a half, all that kind of stuff. So this is much better for the patient. So if you wanted to analyze this even more, here is my DRR, my digitally reconstructed radiograph. Here is, oh, here's my, um, let's see, this is my DRR. This is my portal image. So the image quality has gotten better. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the two. So here I'm looking at my uh, pericardium shadow, the shadow of the heart. I'm watching the chest wall to make sure it's in the right position, uh, that it matches the radiograph. I look at all kinds of dimensions here so that I can see that I am reproducing this every day, not within inches, but we need to be within fractions of an inch or a millimeter or so. So accuracy is the key, and imaging has helped us do that. I'm going to briefly mention this. So Kathleen talked about it. Uh, very common to use now vision RT, which is surface imaging. So the patient, um, we take two scans, one with the free breathing and one where they hold their breath. That is to, to pull the heart and the lung away from the breast tissue so that we can um, just treat the breast. And so the green means the patient has taken a deep breath, and they take an infrared image of the patient that day to see um, where the radiation field is in relation to the pericardium. It's called deep inspiration breath hold. And this, as Kathleen mentioned, we're now using this instead of the gating um, in, with the infrared camera where a lot of places are using vision RT. So on to prostate. Again, we take an image of it and send it to our treatment planning system. Doctor comes in and draws a volume and we can do all kinds of different uh, planning. This is the step and shoot intensity modulated plan where the beam stops and modulates. Uh, the collimators move in and out. They have, they're made of many, many leaves that can conform to the prostate. Or we can do a um, evolving rapidly uh, arc treatment volume, volumetric arc therapy for the prostate where the machine goes around the patient once or twice. This is a little faster um, and can be more conformal depending on the type of uh, treatment that we're trying to do. So the really cool thing though is after we treat them or before we treat them, we do the cone beam CT or a uh, portal image and we can see how well we have brought that patient in, as you saw that patient during treatment on that video. It's amazing that patient can walk in, lay down, and you can be within millimeters. It's just unbelievable. The, you don't want to end up with an image like this. I'm just showing you this for uh, exaggeration purposes. But this is my cone beam here. This is my reference scan that I took on the first day with CT. This is my treatment volume that I've imported. That should really overlie on the prostate. And this, is, this image here is out of alignment, but I'm just showing you that they can grab this here, as Kathleen talked about, and pull it down. And once we get it lined up, um, we can push the table motions to bring everything into place. Now, day to day, we would never have this. If we had this, something's wrong, and then you need to call the physicist, but I'm just using it as an exaggeration. I'll talk more about errors later. So this is what it should look like. Everything should line up and um, correspond. So here we have the KV, here we have our reference image, everything meets, kind of like laying wallpaper, you know? Have you ever laid wallpaper and you wanted the patterns to match? That's what we're trying to do. So this is what another uh, linear accelerator, the Electa uh, accelerator looks like. The purple is the planning CT, digitally reconstructed into the treatment planning system, and then the green is what the cone beam looks like. And so we overlay these to get them to match, to make sure everything lines up. And here is our treatment volume. So if I were doing this uh, in the lung, this is just another example. Here you can see that the, the tumor is not exactly in the center of the ring of what I want to treat. So I can image this with different, using different things. I can use lung, I can use bone. 
depending on what works. This is called the, patient, the uh, treatment volume, the patient treatment volume. And we contour that. And here's my shifts that I ended up having to make, 0 0.01, 0 0.04, and 0 0.05, in order for this to line up to treat this patient. Now, that's really good. This is what we look for. We don't want to see anything close to a centimeter. If we do, then you have to call the physicist and dosimetrist and try to figure out what's going on. So the doctor will come along and he'll manipulate this image and then he hits accept and we push the buttons on the couch and it moves this into place. Um, but this was the shifts that they had to move, so not very much. Okay, so what is this beast of a linear accelerator that has all this fancy stuff? Um, this is an Electa machine, and this is the uh, different imaging modalities that you'll see. So the center of the panel, this is very important. We do extensive QA to make sure that the center of the panel matches with the isocenter of the machine. So my imaging isn't any good unless my MV, my KV, my isocenter, my crosshair, my collimator, my couch, all those things line up. So the imaging has brought another dimension to QA that, that uh, we need to do on the machine. And it right now, I think we timed it with the regular calibration of the output, field size, all that normal stuff that you're used to seeing us do. When you add this imaging QA, it's about six and a half hours per accelerator. So it takes a lot of time. Um, so we have different fields of view here that we can use, a small field of view. All the objects then do uh, end up into the imager, and we can do a half rotation to get the image that we want. If we, if we do things much bigger, then we have to offset our imaging panel and do a 360 rotation to get the full rotation in there. So again, we send this stuff to the machine. We can do all kinds of fancy treatments. This is um, another lung case that is really just a three-field technique, and it sure looks pretty, but we can do better than that now. Um, we can do multiple step-and-shoot type of things where we modulate the beam and uh, rotate around the patient and also rotate the couch to make this configuration work. But obviously, we have to have really good imaging to make sure we're still um, hitting the tumor and sparing the spinal cord. So back to the uh, volume, volumetric arc therapy, which is becoming very popular. Another name for it is rapid arc, depending on the manufacturer. Um, we can do very tight conformal treatments, avoiding the spinal cord, but we couldn't do any of this without imaging. This does tend to be faster, again, so you got the patient laying there. I'll show you some immobilizations where, again, they have to be comfortable, um, and the less they have to lay there, the more accurate the treatment's going to be. So here is a regular lung case. Um, we've lined up the treatment volume, which is purple, over the green volume, which is our cone beam CT. My tumor's right here. If I don't do that correctly, again, um, this is what the group, so you got the spine here and the spine over here, and you can see they are, they are not the same. We're not lined up here. This is way over here. It's supposed to be over here. Now, again, we never have this. I'll say never. If we have it, then they come and get us. But that's what it would look like on this type of system here where we have the purple. Their, their type of localization is the purple and the green. So the benefits are, of course, that we can take our tumor margins and we can make them smaller. And I'll, I'll show you that later, too. My gosh, we used to treat the entire pelvis for a prostate, the entire thing. And we had so many more complications, rectum, bladder. Um, ra radiation therapy, quite frankly, had a bad name, and people didn't want to have radiation treatment because of the complications. Um, so that's one of the biggest uh, advantages. Um, this, this down here on this slide says, correct and moderate setup errors. This uh, slide I borrowed from a, a colleague. Well, I've heard therapists say, we're not going to worry about setting up the patient too carefully because the cone beam's just going to snap them right into place. Well, that's what we don't want to see happen. So if I were an inspector and I came into a facility, I would ask, how do you use that cone beam? How are you setting up the patient? And what's your criteria for if it's off? So it could be that this therapist that's talking is maybe, maybe the cone beam's two centimeters off, but they just go ahead and hit the table, shift everything, snaps into place. Oh, gee, isn't that great? 
That is not what we want to see happen. So back to my lung tumors. Here we are, the lung. So what do you know about the lung? You breathe in, you breathe out, right? The darn thing's moving. So now, as Kathleen talked about, we can track that. Um, it's called gating, and this is the elective system where it is interfaced to the machine in such a way that the machine will automatically shut off once we know the patient's pattern of breathing, shut off and turn back on again. It isn't the most comfortable thing um, to use, uh, but some patients claim that they do, they get used to it. But this is the premise here, that uh, as the patient's cycle is recorded, and we're going to treat down here in the blue, they beam off here when they have respiration. They beam on at the lower part of their cycle. Um, they have the phantom marker on their belly, as they talked about, and the camera was recording, and all this fits together so that you can watch what's going on. Now, in truth, um, according to a lot of my colleagues, it may not be true with the other physicists in the room, but we don't use gating all that much, actually, because um, if we can keep the tumor within a centimeter of movement, which, you'll, which you saw with some of the compression that we used, we don't need to use gating. So it's nice to have, but I wouldn't say it's as commonly used. But this is, again, what that camera looks like. Here's my belly marker, um, patient in an immobilized position, and all this is being recorded along with the respiration on the CT, the 4D CT scanner itself. And um, we put all that into the treatment planning system, we will take, again, here's another uh, view of, we take the various uh, images um, and we record that along with the patient's breathing cycle. It's very complicated. There's a lot of physics that goes in. I don't even understand all of it, to tell you the truth. But what I do understand is that we take the uh, maximum intensity projection and we put that into our treatment plan because we want to know how much is this thing going to move within the volume that I need to treat. What kind of a tumor volume do I need to draw? Do I just draw this center thing here, or do I draw the whole thing? That's up to the physician, and we help the physician figure that out, and we uh, work with defining where our minimum intensity is and where our maximum intensity is. Here's just another way of looking at it. I could focus just on this, or I could focus on the whole projection of the tumor. So. This is a, um, this is my video. Can you see that this uh, image is moving here? So this is the Electa scanner, and the one cool thing about that scanner is it has the real-time cone beam CT on the scanner, um, 4D cone beam CT, so we can see that on the actual scanner before we treat a patient. So um, I, the Varian machine does not have that. If you don't have a 4D CT, scanner in your simulation department, which we do not. We have this Electa, and we can actually put the patient on there and image them this way. Here's the anterior projection of it. You can see the patient's heart moving here and their lungs. And what we can do is we can import a tumor volume in there after the doctor has grown it, drawn it, and we can put concentric rings around that, and we can figure out how much that tumor is going to move within a certain volume, and then we know which patient treatment volume we need to go with. And I'm going to show that right here. Here we have um, the tumor has been drawn here. We'll zoom in on it in a second. So here's the tumor. Here's the concentric rings. So I've got a 2-millimeter margin, a 3, a 4, a 5. You can see the tumor there moving in and out. Can you guys see that? If I can get it to go again. I like to show this twice because it's so cool. But so here's an anterior view of it, the cross-sectional view. You can see that all moving. So we do the initial CT. We draw our volumes. We put them back on the machine, and we watch the tumor, how much it moves. And can you see that that is not moving that much? I don't need to do the gating where I turn it on and off. So this is all well and good, but how much then? So I'm zooming in on it. I'm watching it move. Um, can I reproduce that every day? That's really the key, too. Do I snap it into place? No, we don't snap it into place. So here's a zoomed picture of it here. 
Uh, here's my tumor. Here's my concentric rings. The physician says, you know, I think I'm comfortable with the uh, three millimeter margin on that. The tumor didn't seem to move out of that. So that's what we'll go with. We'll then plan it with the two millimeter margin. Here again is that cut projection here. If you want, if we need to line things up and they can, uh, the doctor has a better chance of viewing um, how he likes to image the tumor by using the two different scans, the cone beam from daily treatment, the reference CT, and he can line everything up. So if this wasn't lined up, these lines would all be um, right to left askew there. So again, he's going to take that. He's going to see where his tumor, this tumor looks, if you cannot see, the ring is a little off center. The tumor is a little off center from the ring. He's going to move that physically by lining up his purple and his green or his black and his white, whatever he chooses, his lung uh, window, his bone window. He will move that into place, and then we make our shifts. So again, it's, it's really incredible that they come in, they lay down, and, and we can be as accurate using our bony landmarks, our immobilization, um, and get these patients treated every day the same. So again, we're back to the shrink wrap. That's exactly the term I was going to use. It looks, this is the body fix system that Kathleen showed. Um, and this is one way we keep the patients uh, from moving too much because they are shrunk wrapped right in there. Uh, this patient has to have his arms over his head. I mean, this all takes time, and it's not, it's not uh, comfortable. Um, so we try to maximize the time that they have to be on the table. Here's another view of the shrink wrapping. Sometimes you can draw your setup marks on there. Uh, tabletop measurements. There's all kinds of measurements. They're on a very um, bean bag that they've sucked the air out of, as she said, that fits just to them. And I'll always say to the patient, be sure you wiggle in there now and feel like you did the other day when we treated you. There's another view of it. And then here is the uh, system actually that we finally went to, and here's your compression. So we don't end up having those big, huge lung movements, and we don't need to gate very often. But here the patient, yeah, she looks like she's happy, but believe me, they're not happy. And what's the age of the patient we're treating? You know, the other day we had an 87-year-old guy and when it comes time to put his arms over his head, I mean, I just hurt for him. I wait to the very last minute to have him put his arms up. And when they're done, believe me, their arms are frozen. They cannot get their arms down. I mean, it hurts. So, you know, we try to do everything, get everything set up and, and leave this, get them set up, do the cone beam, treat them with the rapid arc so that they're not on the table as long. Everything is indexed to the table. All that's written down on first simulation. The bridge height here, the bridge height there, how, mu how much compression, you know, we have special bean bag. This is all very, very important and can take about an hour in the simulation. So another view of it, here's that compression belt. Um, I'm glad that Kathleen talked to you about the six degree of freedom couch. So, you know, we can tip the patient to get everything to line up if we have to. This is not a six degree of freedom couch, but um, I'm glad she talked about that because I forgot to do that. Here's another bag system, um, compression belt that you can use a blood pressure cuff to um, get the compression so that the lung motion isn't quite so much. So what else do we use? We use uh, CT, but we can also fuse it. We have this fusing software now where I can take a PET scan, which images, depending on the tumor, it'll image what I'm looking for better, and I can overlay it or fuse it with my CT scan, and then the doctor comes in and draws these volumes. It's just, it's just great. It's amazing, really, what we can do. And the different projections that you can look at. Here's a PET CT scan overlaying another, a PET scan to overlaying a PET C, a CT scan so that we can fuse the two together. Um, doctor draws volume, and you know, we can flip that patient around and look at them in many different ways with many different imaging modalities. And by golly, we're going to figure out everything, every extent to that tumor. Spec CT. Um, sometimes the spec CT will image something better than anything that we can um, image in, in radiation therapy. So here we have a spec scan that we might want to use for treatment planning. And then this just kind of shows the three most common modalities. You got the CT on the top. So here's my CT. And then let's have an MR. So here's the MRI. And then here's the CT on the bottom. So we're fusing the two. We're trying to line up the bones and everything and making sure we have the right cut. Because, you know, an MRI... Here, here we're lucky that the patient's head is in the same position, but let's say I did this CT last month, and this month I'm going to do the MRI. 
The head may not be in the same position, but the uh, systems that we use can help us to fuse those together much more accurately, and there's an art to that too. So here I have uh, my CT here, you can see the MR, and then finally, I can put all three together. Here's my PET CT. PET on the CT with the MR, and by golly, we're not gonna miss that tumor. But that's where, you know, uh, physics and dosimetry really come into play. We have dosimetrists that all day long, they sit and they play with these images, they line them up, they plan them, we, we, we work with them, we work with the doctor. This takes a lot of time and there's just so much technology involved, it's, uh, it's really mind-boggling. All right, so ultrasound of the prostate. Uh, I just wanted to show that this is real time in the OR. I'm putting seeds in the prostate. I've got my ultrasound in the background and if I need to shift um, where the needle ended up, I can just pull it to where the needle ended up. And this is real-time imaging with an ultrasound doing a prostate, low-dose prostate implant. So my funny story about uh, prostate implants is I had an NRC inspector show up one day and I said, uh, oh, you are so lucky. We're doing an implant today. You should come along. Well, he got white as a ghost. And I said, oh, come on. When else are you going to get this? You should just come in with me. So, you know, we put him in scrubs, and he did not want to go into that room. He was really uh, afraid, and he, he did have to leave early. He wasn't feeling so well. But I thought it was a golden opportunity myself. So getting back to imaging, here we have, you know, your basic brain here. Uh, we used to treat the whole brain. Everything's getting smaller and smaller now, which is why imaging is so important. So here I have my portal image. And um, I mean my, uh, my image on the machine, the portal image, and here's my digitally reconstructed radiograph. This is a very simple application of that same thing I showed you with the breast. Um, but as you can see, things have gotten much more complicated and we can fuse things again. Here's my MRI, I'm gonna fuse it with my PET. I can zero in on that tumor so much better. But the really interesting thing is there's software now that as a doctor starts to contour, you have something called knowledge-based planning or knowledge-based contouring. As that, this is kind of scary, as a physician starts to draw his tumor, as he starts to draw his lymph nodes, as he starts to draw anything in comparison with the patient, the system kind of remembers his drawing style and what he likes to call his lymph node so that the next time he goes to contour something, because all heads are kind of similar, um, it helps him to do that. So I think that's kind of do 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 do. It's kind of scary. But where would we be without imaging? Um, so here's just some other fancy pictures of a tumor volume the patient's drawing. And the treatments, of course, become very complicated. We want to be able to treat this, protect the spinal cord. We don't want to cause too many complications for the patient. Uh, we can look at it with so many different views, and all this takes a lot of time, a lot of QA to make sure that treatment machine isocenter is lined up, the treatment planning is lined up. Here's just another view of um, maybe something gone wrong here, something's a little off. Uh, here's my KV, here's my reference image, and things are not lining up correctly. Here's another exaggerated view. So my, my, my drawing here of my tumor volume is going to stay the same because it's plopped in there but the image is gonna move and this needs to move with it. So we need to fix that. Again, you grab and you move. And again, if it's that off, we would not treat, but we would have someone look at that. It's another view of incorrect alignment. And if you look down here, you see the shifts are 1.7. You know, so we don't wanna be shifting stuff over a centimeter. Less, you know, we like to keep it, our, our uh, criteria is 0.75 or less. And that depends, too, on the tumor. If I'm right up against the brain stem, do you think I want a 0.75 shift? Uh, I don't think so. I'll be treating my brain stem. This is what it should look like. So just take a deep breath. Things do get better. That's what it should look like. And here's my numbers, 0 0.4, 0 0.05, 0 0.1. But if you look at that shrink wrapping, I mean, it's amazing. They come in, they lay down, they put their arms up. You know, we have to make sure everything's, and, and, and inevitably, things look great. I'm, I'm always amazed myself, to tell you the truth. So uh, what nobody talked about, and what I thought everybody else was going to talk about, was the QA that we do. So we do do a lot of QA. One of the tests is called a Winston Lutz test, and that makes sure that the isocenter of the machine 
and all our imaging uh, is lining up and accurate so that they all correspond to each other so we can trust when we want to try to hit a two millimeter margin. We can talk about that some other, some other CRCPD day. Okay, so we can also have some errors. Definitely we have errors. Um, what if I send my CT into the treatment planning system under the wrong patient's ID number? Everything has an ID number. You just don't go by Mrs. Smith anymore. So my number might be about seven, seven numbers long, and, you know, things could get screwed up where you send in Mrs. Jones into Mr. Smith's um, file, and then all of a sudden you're planning... Uh, maybe an abdomen, you're supposed to be planning a prostate. Something like that could happen. So you have to have all your numbers right. That's one thing that can go wrong. When I get all done planning, I'm going to send it back to the machine. So the therapist, they have their basic setup that they're going to do, but a lot of the parameters are embedded into that field for that patient. And the monitor units, uh, how much they're going to expose the patient, that's all embedded. So I want to make sure I'm going to send the right scan for the right patient back over uh, to the machine. This happens a little bit more automatically with some systems, but with the Electa system, we have to make sure that whatever we send was correct for that patient. Um, you know, I could send a plan, but then I could send maybe the wrong contours that I'm looking at on that breathing. I could, I could maybe send version 4, and I was supposed to send version 5. So these are all wonderful, fun things that we get to worry about. Maybe my CT data, that has happened a lot. Every prostate looks the same. And um, the wrong reference data was sent over for, for the same patient getting his prostate treated. So when the, when the shifts are off by over a centimeter, you know, you got to dig and find the root cause of what's going on. Just things that keep us up at night. So um, set up uncertainty. You know, when the patient comes in, we better have some landmarks so that we can actually measure how, how far down the isocenter is supposed to be from the sternal notch, for instance. And I'll show you a good example of, a, of an error that happened. Internal organ motion, uh, you know, this can change. So even though we do that scan, depending on the patient's disease, uh, what's going on with them that day, the motion can change. Um, so this organ def deformation is where um, I may have a patient from two years ago that was treated, and I can import her plan, and I can overlay and fuse her CT from today, but I have to trust my software and make sure that my software is doing that right. So it takes a critical eye to look at it and make sure um, that that's being done correctly. Just because it looks pretty and everything looks like it's lined up, it may not be correct. So here's an example of an error. So here we have uh, the cone beam CT. And it is, uh, this is the body contour outline here. Here's the body contour outline there. Does that look like it fits? No, there's supposed to fill up. This is supposed to be all cone beam CT stuff here. This is supposed to be all gray. And this looks like, actually, it looks like the chest, the breasts. We're treating a lower spine here. So what happened is the therapist... Uh, didn't use their landmarks, and they were about eight centimeters too high for this cone beam. And the patient was treated this way three days in a row, and this was actually a misadministration, and the state came in, and we explained what happened. Um, wasn't anywhere that I was involved in, of course, but no. So this is what it should have looked like. So here we are down, filling in the body. We're trying to treat the spine. Here we are. We're down here. We're not up here. We're down here. Now, one of the things you'll notice is this cone beam isn't really very long. It's not very long soup to imp what you get on the cone beam. So the first portal image that was taken is this one here. And I don't care how high up the lights are or how low the lights are. I'm comparing this to my digitally reconstructed radiograph, and I'm looking at the spine. And do you think you could make out if you're in the right area? Now, it'd be nice to count some ribs. Who's an x-ray tech out there? I love you, x-ray techs, the radiation therapy th therapists. A lot of them are no longer former x-ray techs, and we have a couple of x-ray techs in our department, and thank you, God, for them, because the anatomy that they know has saved us many, many times. So, yes, if I, if I could see all my ribs and I'd know where I was, I mean, it's kind of hard to know where you're at here, and especially here. 
So what they've gone to doing is they take two port films, they count the ribs, make sure they're in the right spot, and they measure, now they have, you know, why should we have external landmarks when we have the cone beam? It'll just snap into place. So again, can you tell that's my pet peeve? Are we making a difference? You know, I have an old physician that uh, I, I work with, and for the first time he's saying, boy, this really makes a difference. A lot of this technology that's come along, you know, 3D treatment planning, contouring, using a computer, oh, we're not really, you know, this really isn't making a difference. But now he's finally seeing that we can make things smaller and we can make things better and his patients aren't having as many side effects. So, like I said, we used to treat the entire pelvis and then when we were doing 3D, we used to treat a little bit bigger area before imaging. So we used to treat this whole thing. Um, but now we can zero in on, for instance, just the prostate. And our margins have gone from centimeters, like, you know, 14 by 14 to a three centimeter margin. We thought we were really doing good with something like that. Now we can have two and three millimeter margins. So we don't have to treat as much normal tissue. We can image it and we do a much better job of treating the patient. You can see this here um, on all views. So yeah, we're making a big difference. And as I said, things are getting smaller and smaller. So when we used to treat the whole brain, now we can treat these tiny little lesions. And if this patient has two or three more down here, oh, we're not going to treat the whole brain. No, we can just treat those little tiny lesions. So that's kind of still, uh, that is, that's happening. Um, you know, sometimes you chase tumors too. We'll treat two or three, and then two or three more will pop up, and maybe they should have just had a whole brain in the first place. But this is what, what the trend is, you know, to not treat as much normal tissue as we can. And so we couldn't do this without imaging. You see how close I am here? I'm about a millimeter from that uh, brain stem. So if I'm off by a millimeter in my imaging, if my QA isn't within a millimeter, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be treating that patient effectively and accurately. So it's really amazing what we can do now with imaging. We can spin things around. We can look at what's going on on the outside, um, make all kinds of fancy pictures. Nothing is as good as the QA, though, that is done to make sure this is all accurate. So what do we do for follow-up? Uh, how do we know it's working? So here's my tumor, and it's not there anymore. Same thing with breast cancer. You know, those, those women, depending on their disease, they get, they get scans twice a year, once a year. Um, and so it's always in the imaging that can tell us if, if it's working. Now, the coolest thing that you're going to hear more about is 3D printing. And um, they can take a CT scan. They can digitally reconstruct it to the AP view. And then a printer can print the uh, bony anatomy. And that can be used for a lot of things. Surgeons use it a lot to flip that 3D print around and figure out what angle they're going to come in and attack the tumor with. What vessel do they need to clip in order to effectively um, help this person with, with kidney issues? And I can see us using this in treatment planning, too, because we kind of do that now on the computer. We can flip people all around and do all kinds of things. So we're at war with cancer, and I think we're uh, making some headway here, but certainly the basis of it all is imaging and QA. And um, speaking of at war with, with cancer, this next slide will demonstrate how my linear accelerator is combating the evil spirits of the cancer. comes my onboard imaging. So there you have it. 
Uh, I want to thank Electa Varian for slides, Mim Vista, which is the fusing software, and various colleagues, and all those patients I showed were uh, fictitious. Uh, I mean, we treat those patients, but they weren't the actual patient. So thanks very much. Another joke or no? <laughs>